I was visiting Karnataka after a gap of about 10 years. The last time was soon after meeting a friend who had just returned after participating in the struggle at Tharwad. Haven't you heard about the fascinating struggle put up by the people against the pollution of the Tunga Badwa River? He asked enthusiastically. I was ashamed to admit that I had not heard about the epic resistance by ordinary farmers and fishermen in a neighboring state. So I packed up my bags and left. When I finally met S.R. Hiremat and understood what he was doing, I was simply astounded. The son of a landless laborer completes his studies, goes off to America and becomes a senior executive in a company. Decades later, he heads back to his childhood town, accompanied by his American wife, who enthusiastically joins his pioneering efforts. A basic desire was uh, from an interesting incident uh, when I was in high school. I had gone to hear Dr. Shivaram Karanth. So this was at an uh, annual social gathering of a high school. He was talking about uh, how a human being should live a responsible life. One of the concepts he had talked about is debt to the society. Since I came from very poor background and because of the scholarships, prizes, I could go to college and complete my education, I had a keen desire to pay the debt back to the society. Uh -huh. First, I joined what was called the FISA, Federation of India Student Associations of America. And uh, later on, those of us who were keenly interested in India's development, we formed a group in 1974, January, called India Development Service, or IDS in brief. Schumacher, I came to know again from my friends from IITs who were working in the villages. I had asked them, that how do I prepare for planning to work in the rural areas? How do I get the necessary background and the perspective? So they had given me a paper called Unemployment Problem in India. And that was written by Dr. E.F. Schumacher, which was later to be a chapter in his book called Small is Beautiful, Economics as if uh, People Mattered. I would say that it made the deepest impact okay. and made me really understand what is the socio-economic conditions, how does a country adopt its development policies? How can the poor be helped and so on? The Hiremats identified 72 villages for development and began work under the umbrella name of India Development Service. Soon it was obvious that the rights would have to be fought for. But IDS being a developmental agency could not participate in agitations. So a new organization was floated. Samaj Parivartan Samudaya, whose work was to be entirely overseen by Mr. Hiramat. So as we were making immense uh, uh, progress through the village health workers, through the village veterinary workers, we found that there was a distinct difference in terms of the impact on the villages which are on the bank of the Tungabhadra River and the villages which are inside. And on the bank of the river Tungapadra, uh, there was a more acute problem of human health and cattle health and others. And this was largely due to the heavy pollution of uh, Tungapadra river and the air by the two Birla industries located uh, further down from this Medleri village about 20 kilometers near a village called Nalwagar. When I met the poor residents who lived in the vicinity of the Tungabhadra river and understood their plight, I was truly shocked. A company puts up its industrial unit near the river bank and proceeds to upset the ecological balance of the entire surroundings with utter disregard for the life of both the fish and the fishermen. Rivers are regarded as the cradle of culture. Over centuries, a certain lifestyle builds up around them. And here I was, witness to a textile giant that was destroying decades of existence with utter callousness. The smoke that poured out of the factory chimneys had literally incapacitated life and livelihood in two entire villages. No trees grew here. Those which did were stunted. Even the children appeared stunted here. 
The smoke was so dangerously toxic that any object got misshapen. I saw iron poles that had been corroded. I saw electricity poles which had become twisted and bent. On construction sites, iron rods inserted inside cement slabs had gone rusted. We believe that gold is one mineral that is immune to any decay, but I saw gold ornaments worn by women had turned black after being exposed to the pollution. I shuddered to think, if this could happen to gold, what must be happening to delicate human lungs which breathe this poisonous air? To uncover the effects of water pollution, I visited villagers who stayed on the banks of the river and survived on fishing. They cast their nets into the water, the same water in which the factory disposes its effluents. The company had not bothered to install any gadget to filter the water. It was released into the river just as it was. The toxins proved so dangerous that they destroyed the oxygen in the water. Starved of oxygen, the fish died and floated up to the surface. Things were especially bad during summer when water dried up, increasing the concentration of toxins in the water. The fish kills went up alarmingly. These corrosive toxins often prove dangerous to the fragile fishing nets as well. For a fisherman, the net is his basic source of livelihood. A damaged fishing net spells starvation. Does the water harm you? I asked. They pointed to their bare legs, which showed extensive signs of skin disease. When I asked if the water affected their health in any other way, they raised their shirts and pointed at their stomachs. To my horror, I saw scores of cases which clearly showed post-operative scars. The illnesses caused by drinking this toxic water were so serious that many residents needed abdominal surgery. The uniqueness of the protest launched by Hiremat and his colleagues was their extensive use of facts. Contacting scientists in the Karnataka University, they got the water tested and identified the names and quantities of the toxins present. The findings were documented and published in the media. Copies were sent to both the government and the Pollution Control Board. After this, the SPS persuaded the people to organize and launch an agitation. There were two or three important steps uh, you know, we took in the beginning. First one was, are the people interested in working on their own problem and taking the primary responsibility? So we had a padhyatra, you know, this foot march in these affected villages for about uh, five days. A team of us who were already working in rural development, we took leave along with some volunteers. We went through the area. So we found that the problem was quite severe and the affected people were willing to do it. So this was the first step. The second step was to go to an area where a similar problem has been tackled by others and whatever lessons we can learn from them. So I had learned that Kerala Shastra Sahitya Parishad has tackled a similar pollution of water and air caused by the same Birla owned industries in Calicut district near a village called Maur. So a team of us went for a study visit, studied how they have tackled this problem and what we can learn. And what we learned was organizing the affected people, who would be the engine, a sustainable process in the long run. And that has to be supported by the uh, scientific studies, by the legal action and by involving other uh, persons from the various sections of society who are concerned about the problem. The first decision that anybody takes is in the minds. So a team of us, uh, the village activists, volunteers, and more importantly, some primary school teachers, we went to Gujarat for a 15-day orientation camp in Vedchi because they were very concerned about this non-violent direct action in such serious live problems.
See, non-violent direct action is basically a rediscovery of the techniques that uh, Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi so successfully used during our freedom struggle. Non-violent direct action is a general or a generic term for a broad spectrum of techniques that are used. Some, for example, what they call as a visual line. So, wherever you have a serious case of exploitation, where you have a serious problem like pollution, standing just in front of the factory in silence for four hours, that is called a visual line. So, most of them are satyagrahis who are trained. Then we have a small group of people who sing songs. We have a small group of people who sell the publications and all that. So, it is a first step which is very legal, basically asserting our right of expression of the suffering that the people have taken. And it goes to the other broad spectrum of non-violent direct action where you have what is called civil disobedience. In other words, you break the laws in order to drive home a point that there is a serious case of exploitation and in order to get something done, you need to resort to more serious forms of non-violent direct action. For example, closing down the Karnataka State Pollution Control Board office in uh, Davanagiri. For us, keeping the struggle non-violent is an act of faith. Of course, it is difficult. It requires enormous patience. Agitators must not fall into the typical syndrome. I hit him because he hit me first. The first visual line in front of the factory created tremendous uh, courage among the women that in this country we do have a right to express how we have suffered due to the pollution of this factory, how these people are exploiting the labor, the resources of this area without discharging their social responsibility and how affected people have a right to organize themselves, to protest and to bring pressure on the government. So that was a first major victory was that the fear in the minds of the people that police may resort to lati charge and all that as it has happened earlier went away. So that was the first building of confidence in the people that they can protest. Yeah. The second thing was that we had formulated small demands. For example, first one of the demands was to get information about the levels of pollution. Because in order to fight, you need to know where it is at. And the factory people disowning their own responsibility said you go to the pollution control board. Yeah. So that brought us in touch with the pollution control board. Yeah. The second one was that there was a school very close to the factory where they had dumped these wastes, which were very hazardous for children's health. Mm -hmm. So we said that they must be removed. And we had, among the delegation of people, not only the leaders from various